Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome ConnectWise Chief Executive Officer Arnie Bellini. All right, great. So it's awesome to see all of you back from Dave and Buster's. I was a little bit afraid, but I'm so glad to see that you made it back. Um, I think there are still some of you down by the pool. Uh, we'll scrape them up and bring them up here in a little bit. But it looked like a great time last night. I'm really excited today because, I mean, I think it's amazing that we have 1,300 of you here today connecting and sharing and exploring uh, each other's worlds, uh, exploring how you do business, uh, exploring the ConnectWise platform, and hopefully, and most importantly, connecting with each other and sharing your wisdom, uh, sharing what you know about how to be successful in this industry. And let me say something, you know, I, I mean, ConnectWise built our business way, way back in 1982 when the PC first came out, but there was a real big problem. And the problem was we just had a single PC. And so there I was at Price Waterhouse, up on the 29th floor, downtown Tampa, you know, until midnight, working on this one PC with a 360K floppy drive, and you had a boot DOS with like three disks. Anyone remember this? Yeah? No, come on, you guys are going, this is ancient stuff. It's like, but that was revolutionary for me. That was like mind blowing because I'd been working on mainframes and mini computers where you had to sort of stand in line and wait your turn with your tape, or God forbid, your deck of cards okay, and say, please run my program, right? And they'd say, we'll get to that in about three hours, and if you're lucky, the printout will be over there in that bin in five. Uh, and that's what computing was. It was mainframe. It was bound to only the most uh, 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 prestigious, uh, uh, profitable enterprise companies. No one else could afford PCs. When the PC came out, it changed everything. And that's when I jumped into this industry and, you know, we'll never jump out because it's where everything is happening. And you are the ones that are making that happen. There was a problem. We had PCs, we had floppy disks, and that was how we transferred information until local area networks came out. And local area networks did not work for the longest time. If you remember, those of you that are old enough to remember, they didn't work, right? Craig talked about the history yesterday. This is kind of a continuation of that. They didn't really work, okay? Uh, but then came Ethernet. And it worked. And it became a standard. And it allowed David, my brother and I, to start building a business in Tampa Bay, connecting all these PCs together on local area networks. And then Al Gore invented the internet, and we connected him to the internet, and here we are today. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I must tell you that it's such a privilege to, uh, to have Robert Metcalf with us here today, because uh, Bob Metcalf, he likes to go by Bob, uh, invented Ethernet. Uh, wrote a paper back in 1973, actually, uh, at the uh, Palo Alto Research Labs on a concept of taking what he had seen, which was sort of ARPANET, which was j the internet before Al Gore discovered it, uh, the, the ARPANET, and he wanted to bring that right down into the office, right? Right where you could use it to connect PCs together. And so he invented the Ethernet protocol, offered it out for being a standard so what you're really looking at is a father uh, today of the internet uh, in so many ways. You know, this is an open standard. Uh, he invented it, uh, and he is now um, uh, also a professor at the University of Texas, a professor of innovation. Uh, he holds the chair at the University of Texas in entrepreneurship. Uh, and it is my pleasure to introduce to you the inventor of Ethernet, one of the fathers of the internet, Bob Metcalf. You're going to leave me alone up here? 
Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much. So we are uh, connected. And uh, just in case some of you have to leave early, I'm going to talk about how cool it is to be connected, how we got so connected so quickly, and why we're not done yet. And so the idea of connecting things is alive and prospering. Of course, I'm going to take 50 slides to do that. <laughs> Let me begin by stating, can you read that? I don't think so, but uh, the, most in, the single most important fact, new fact, about the human condition is that we are connected. And, and we're getting more connected every day. And here comes the augmented video mobile gigabit internet of things moving us forward. Now, some of you, most of you are probably too young to remember this mindset, but there was a time that when your mom said, when you get there, call me, let it ring three times and then hang up. The reason she did that is that she loved me, my mother loved me, your mother loved you, but not that much. <laughs> there was a time when this was the community, that's how connected we were. Even our own mothers wanted us to hang up after three rings. So I, uh, my mom would do this when I was going off to school and I went, o went off to school for quite a long time. This is not a career, but I was a full-time student for 23 years. Then engineer scientist where I did that internet, this is before Al Gore. And then the, uh, Al Gore did not invent the internet. <laughs> Al Gore invented global warming. So. <laughs> then, then I did the 3Com thing for 11 or 12 or 13 years. Then I became a columnist at InfoWorld and publisher. And then I was a venture capitalist for 10 years. And uh, now I'm a professor. I've been a professor for seven years, so I'm getting ready to move on. And uh, I think my next career is going to be stand-up comic. <laughs> By the way, do you want to hear my joke? Yes. So I have a joke. Yeah, I'm getting ready to be a stand-up comic. And it relates, it relates to this statement. You, know, you heard, and you will hear many more times, that I invented Ethernet. Uh, but that's only true for some values of these three variables. Did I invent Ethernet, or was it Dave and I, or was it Butler and Chuck, or was it 100 other people in the intervening 45 years who invented Ethernet? So that variable is up for grabs. What does it mean to invent something? It means you have a patent, or you built it, or you sold it, or something. And then there's what is Ethernet, which is uh, a subject of great debate, because it's nothing like the Ethernet that Dave Boggs and I built in 1973. But for certain small values of I invented Ethernet, I invented Ethernet. And it turns out there's a this, here comes a joke. Uh, <laughs> oh, you're not supposed to say that. I'm sorry. Uh, there's a society for people who have invented things that plug into a, a PC. I invented Ethernet, as you've heard. But there's also the RS-232 guy, who's a really old one, the, uh, the uh, HDMI guy, the, the um, Oh, the USB guy from Intel, and, and we meet every quarter to celebrate our being cool. <laughs> and the last time we met was sad, because the USB guy had died. And the, the assembled uh, inventors, we became the pallbearers at his funeral. And we needed to carry his coffin across the street to the cemetery where the grave had been dug. So we carried the coffin over and we were lowering it into the grave when it jammed. So we took the coffin out and we rotated it 180 degrees <laughs> and were able to lower it into the ground. So that's the beginning of my career as a stand-up comic. Now all of you, I assume many of you know what Ethernet is, how boring it is, it's plumbing. It's, ether, it's internet plumbing. And you know there's all these layers on top of, here's ethernet way down at the bottom. But there's all these other layers up here. You have, for example, the World Wide Web is way up there. So Tim Berners-Lee, my friend, invented the World Wide Web in 1989. He had all the fun. I had to provide all the plumbing, which basically 
reduces down to this standard Ethernet frame. They call it a frame now. I used to call it a packet. And of course, these frames lug around the Internet datagrams, providing Internet protocol. Um, so they don't let plumbers out very much, and we don't have much glamour. But in 1990-something, I got a call from Steve Jobs. And Steve said, Bob, we're going to send a limousine to your house. We want you to come to the opening of Toy Story at De Anza College on Stevens Creek Boulevard in Cupertino. The limo came, took me to the grand opening. There was a red carpet, Hollywood style. Steve had hired photographers with big flash attachments to make us feel important. We went in. We saw the movie. It was fabulous. I came out. There was Steve. Steve, fabulous movie. I would like to remind you that every single pixel of that beautiful movie was carried by Ethernet. And Steve looked at me and he smiled and he said, thank you. And I've been living off that thank you ever since, the mid-90s. <laughs> but now I'm back to being a plumber. So this is uh, my baby picture. You'll notice in my baby picture, I am holding a telephone which was the principal means of connectivity in those days, 1946. But look what happened, to try to give you a sense, and this is one of the things I'm trying to do, is to give us a sense of the pace of innovation, the pace of progress. So let's go, go back to the biggest event in my life, 1946. But 1947, look what happened in 1947. There were 40,000 televisions in 1947. And the, and the commercial ramp of TV started that year. The cellular telephone paper was published that year, called the Zero-G cell phone. The microwave oven was invented, holography was invented, the first life went to space and back, they were fruit flies that went up to 68,000 feet. The first CRT video game, the word computer was used for the first time in the modern sense. The first bug was found, an actual moth, short-circuiting a logic board. The AK-47 was invented, but fortunately for all of us, so was the transistor, beginning what became the computer revolution and the growth of the Internet. This was my first computer, uh, IBM 1401. Here are the punch cards. You would punch them in the card punch, put them in the card reader, and the next day you'd get your output, usually a bunch of error messages <laughs> here. And while I was a student at MIT, a new kind of computing arrived uh, called interactive time sharing. Here's two mini computers. And instead of punching cards, you would type your programs into a teletype. And there'd be about 50 of these connected to each of the time sharing systems. And the cool thing was you would type in your programs and your data, and you'd get the answer in five seconds instead of overnight. And that was the, what drove the arrival of these machines. And while we were learning about that, I did a senior project at MIT. Four of us were commissioned a senior project to build a computer. One guy got this CPU, one guy got the ALU, one guy got the, I, the I.O. device, I got the memory. And I built this memory, and it was an acoustic delay line memory where the way you would store bits is you'd send them by torquing a cable, physically torquing it. The torque would propagate and come out the other end of the cable. And if you wanted to store bits, you would then send those bits back into the cable and just keep them circulating. So this project, I learned a lot about digital electronics, and I learned, and I listened to this, I learned how to send one bit at a time down a very long cable. And that's what I learned with this senior project. Around that time, this mini computer arrived. This is the first internet packet switch. Actually, this, is, this probably is the first one. They gave me number six. And, the, and my job, and the, the reason they gave it to me is because I had learned how to send a bit at a time down a long cable, so I built this thing. And its job was to connect this mini computer to this mini computer, and this packet switch, I guess today you'd call them a router, uh, would send the packets around the world. And so, we ended up in 1973 with an internet that looks like this, and each of these dots is a packet switch, a, a router. And here's the one I did. I connected MIT over here, and then later when I moved to Xerox, I got to do it again. 
and put Xerox on the internet. And that's, it's embarrassing to those of us at the University of Texas that this 50 kilobit circuit, 50 kilobit circuit, are you familiar with the prefix kilo? <laughs> Went through Texas but did not stop in Austin. So then uh, the internet made its debut publicly in 19, 72 at the Hilton in Washington, and I edited this book, Scenarios for Using the ARPANET, basically a series of interactions, how you would log, log into sites around the United States and see these apps. And then I got my PhD from Harvard for doing this. Harvard and I don't get along. Uh, they made six copies of my dissertation. MIT made hundreds of copies, and by the way, you can still buy my dissertation at Amazon.com. I also participated as U.S. representative here, USA, that's me right there, uh, producing, uh, pr uh, promulgating the internet worldwide. But then we arrived, 1972, I arrive at Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, have put Xerox on the ARPANET, which was a connection of time-shared computers, and Xerox decided to build personal computers. And let me show you what was in my office. There is the most advanced computer terminal, a Texas instrument, Silent 700, 30 characters per second, 300 baud, 300 bits per second. Up there is a box of 35 millimeter slides. This was 1972. I was on the board of the company that developed PowerPoint. We sold it in 1987 for $14 million. There was no PowerPoint in 19. 72, but there is, so that's how we made presentations. We would literally make 35 millimeter slides and project them. This is an actual Rolodex. <laughs> this is an actual, believe it or not, a telephone. And these are pencils. <laughs> and then there's this magic device, which unfortunately didn't get in the picture. It's an IBM Selectric typewriter, which was right here in the picture. And it was on that device that I typed this memo, Inventing Ethernet, on May 22nd, 1973. And of course, the Ethernet in those days was a shared coaxial cable to which you would tap in and send your packets up and down this cable. And I don't know if you can see it. What does it say over here? It says Radio Ether. So this is the annoying slide in which I claim to have invented Wi-Fi. And it really annoys the 100 people who did invent Wi-Fi. And this is the patent, which issued in 1977 on Ethernet. And this is what we built. This is the personal computer at Xerox Research. There's an Ethernet in the back. And, and let me try to explain what this meant. Ethernet in this PC meant these four things. It was packet switched. It was not a character-oriented communication system. We were sending packets, internet packets. It allowed you to bring the internet not to the building, but throughout the building, because we were moving from time sharing to personal computing. The bandwidth increase was a factor of 10,000. So on one day, I went from 300 bits per second to almost, well, 2.94 megabits per second, which is almost 10,000 times in one day. Uh, and later, as you'll hear in a minute, we organized this around standards. So these are the, this is what Ethernet did. It made bandwidth go from scarcity to abundance. Now, have you all done, had anything to do with cabling Ethernet? And you've also had a lot to do with Wi-Fi. So a lot of people who have wasted their lives stringing Ethernet cables have asked me why we, why we didn't just use radio from the start in 1973. One of the predecessor networks to Ethernet was the Aloha Network at the University of Hawaii. This is the volcano in, uh, on Oahu. What's it called? Diamond Head. And this is the Aloha Network radio, packet radio modem. This, this thing, like this. It cost $30,000. It was as big as the personal computer we had at Xerox Research. And it ran at 4,800 bits per second. That's why we had to put Ethernet on cable. We could not use these radios. They were too big and expensive and slow. So we had to wait 25 years for chips like this to be developed by Broadcom. 
that would allow us to use access points and, and have wireless ethernet. And by the way, this is the Wireless Ethernet Compatibility Association, and in 1999, it changed its name to, what do you think, Wi-Fi. So maybe I really did invent, no, 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 no. So, so this was the Ethernet in 1976. So I believe the standard color for uh, Ethernet cable should be yellow. So if you're using blue, I would appreciate if you would switch to yellow. <laughs> and my Rolodex got bigger. Because fortunately, I discovered during this period that dealing with technology was cool, but dealing with people was important and difficult. So I began assembling, growing my Rolodex card. Steve Jobs is in there somewhere. Did you hear that? The technology is important, but dealing with people. People are much more complicated and interesting than electrons. And I learned that in time. So I incorporated that certificate number one of 3Com Corporation. Did my business plan. Steve Jobs made me buy an Apple II and run a program on it called VisiCalc, the first spreadsheet. And the venture capitalist told me my business plan had to be $50 million a year in five years or they wouldn't back me. So using VisiCalc, I made a product template and I typed in the first one for my first product. And in the lower right-hand corner, I had a cell that added up all the product templates. And I just kept adding products, oh, by the way, five years by month, because I didn't know how to consolidate the, the rows. And I kept doing that until I ended up at 50 million in five. And then I stopped, I printed it out, and this was, became the business plan of 3Com Corporation, which is available on the internet. This was our first product, the first commercial version of TCP IP. Have you heard of TCP IP? We did the first commercial version of it for Unix in 1980. And then we did our first hardware product. This is an Ethernet transceiver of basically a 10 megabit per second modem. And I continued to get help from Steve Jobs. This is Steve over here. Do you recognize him? Do you know who I'm talking about when I say Steve? In my house, we just say Steve, and we know who we're talking about. Well, this is Regis McKenna, the head, who was Steve's marketing guy, who came up with this logo. And Steve introduced me to Regis, and he became 3Com's marketing guru for free because Steve asked him to. I'll always be grateful to Steve for that. And one of the marketing ideas we came up with was promoting Ethernet as an industry standard, not a proprietary standard. That seems old today, but it was new then. And so we produced a spec, three big companies, Digital Equipment Corporation, then the number two computer company in the world, Intel and Xerox, produced a spec which we called the Blue Book and submitted it to an IEEE committee that we created called IEEE 802 to make Ethernet a standard, which they did. It took them a couple of years, but they did. Meanwhile, my company started growing. This is the crazy inventor. This is the investor, Dick Kramlick, and this is the adult supervision, Bill Krauss, who we recruited from HP to run the company. We had a problem, though. The only PCs in the world were Apple IIs, and the Apple IIs had 8-bit 6502 microprocessors, and they were not worthy of Ethernet. That is, their memory bandwidth was too slow. So we couldn't sell Ethernet for the only PCs in the world. So we had to, as a startup, we had to do what's called pivoting. So we began selling Ethernet cards for personal, uh, for mini computers. This is a famous mini computer. It's the one that Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie developed Unix on. We got the, we put an Ethernet adapter in there. And then we became the Ethernet supplier for Sun Microsystems, makers of uh, uh, workstations worthy of Ethernet. And here's, here's Ethernet coming in on a thin cable, quarter inch instead of half inch, going into a card plugged into the workstation and then continuing on to others. What we discovered was that the pace of progress was due to Moore's Law. We, had to, we were stationed in Silicon Valley, but we waited for the correct semiconductors. And in 1982, in a partnership with another startup, we came up with the first Ethernet chip, 
that baby right there, which allowed us to cram an entire ethernet adapter, including the transceiver, which had previously been outboard, to put it on one card so that we could plug it into that. So the IBM PC in 1981, August, announced this PC. We scrambled together this card using that chip that was brand new. And then we, we did another really smart thing. We stopped trying to sell our products direct to customers. And we adopted the channel ecosystem as our model. So we, you may remember companies like Businessland and Computerland. They were new the same time we were new. And then later we went to two-step distribution. And so, we are, so another one of our approaches to success was plugging into the existing and growing ecosystem of the channel and the, of the channels. Our competitors thought networking was too complicated and they needed to sell it themselves directly and we just blew past them using, using the channel. So we sold, are you still with me? Is anyone not with me? Could you, could you leave please? We sold a starter kit. It was a three node network, three cards, about $1,000 each, and a diskette. And with this, you could plug into three PCs and you could share a disk. So you could put a disk on one of the PCs and share it among all three. You could take a printer, and printers were expensive in those days. A laser writer was $7,000. You could put that on a PC and share it with the other two PCs. Or we had an email package where anybody on any one of the PCs could send an email to anyone on the other two. <laughs> now this was a successful promotion, this starter kit, and a lot, since it only cost $3,000, a lot of people could do that on their expense account. So we weren't selling to CIOs. By this time, we were waiting for the CIOs to die. <laughs> because they were all basically IBM employees and we were competing with them, so we learned to sell below the CIOs and a $3,000 starter kit worked, except it had one problem. After a year of this, our customers said, this thing does exactly what you said it would do, but it's just not very useful. And if you've ever sold anything, that's really bad news. So I made this slide. It became, I made six copies of it, because that's how big the sales force was. And this slide basically said, the cost of your network goes up linearly as you buy our cards for, say, $1,000 or $500 each. But the number of possible connections thereby enabled goes up as the square. And as you may know from math, the quadratic generally overtakes the linear, and there's a critical mass point here. So what I coached our sales force to say to our customers was the reason that your trial network is not useful is that it's not big enough. And what, by the way, what is the remedy to that problem? Buying more of our products. So that was shrewd on behalf of the head of sales. And I was the head of sales and marketing then. Uh, by the way, our customers believed us. And we went public a few months later in, uh, when was it? Oh, I forgot this point. Engineers are generally skeptical of marketing people. So the question was asked many times, was this slide a lie? And the answer is it was not a lie because I had had the benefit of a time machine. And time machines are very valuable in growing a company. I was a, this time machine is called the Xerox Palo Alto Research Center and in it we flew 10 years into the future. We filled Xerox with networks of personal computers interconnected with routers, sound familiar? and we saw that it was good. And everyone else who saw it inside of Xerox saw that it was good. So we knew, I knew when I made that slide that I was not lying, that, that bigger networks are better and you better hurry up and build one. So we were able on the, the fact that we told that story and our customers believed us and they grew their networks that we were able to go public in uh, 1984. This was the year Cisco was founded. If I were a better person, there would be no Cisco today. <laughs> um, by the way, if you're interested in money, and I know some of you are, uh, I started 3Com with a $27,000 that I won in a lawsuit with a real estate agent. This is my entire net worth in 1979. 
then sold for $1.1 million, sold a third of the company, then a year later stepped up its value by two and raised 2.2 million, stepped it up again the next year, raised 4.4, went public, raised $11 million in our IPO. And then a couple of years later, we raised 25 million more. I retired in 1990. 3Com did 5.77 billion in 1999 with a market cap of $34 billion. I want you, well, in 1999, every company was worth $34 billion. <laughs> and then when, uh, many years later, 3Com uh, in 2010 became part of the Hewlett Packard Company for $2.7 billion, and I didn't even get half of it. <laughs> and there's an amusing arithmetic you can do. You can take 2.7 billion. Notice the significant digits of this number are two and seven. And you notice the significant digits in this number are two and seven. So there's an irresistible division, even though it's nonsensical. And uh, basically it says we got 100,000 X in our initial investment. So how did Ethernet win the land wars? Well, we were standard and the marketplace wanted standard. So our predecessors went down. ArcNet, you can still buy ArcNet today, but it's it went from leader to nothing because they opted not to be an open industry standard from San Antonio, Texas, I might add. Then there were the standards. General Motors didn't know how to build a network, so its token bus died, and they subsequently, as you may know, went bankrupt, which is what you get. Uh, IBM didn't have its heart in making it a standard, so uh, Ethernet emerged. We were native mode. We knew what it was like to be a packet switching company. Because we had semiconductors, we were, well, first of all, Ethernet worked. I think you just said that, Arnie. Yes, it did work. By the way, it's a, it's a disadvantage when your predecessors don't work because then people don't want to use your product because it doesn't, it's not going to work either. So we had to get over that, incidentally, with the channel. The channel hated networking for a while. We had to turn them around. Uh, we were standard with multi-vendor support through the IEEE. We had operating system support and apps in Unix and our own 3Com's own Ether Series Netware, which you may have heard of, but I, I've long since forgotten. Uh, uh, we were really standard. That is, we stressed the interoperability among competing products, not simply conformance. Interoperability is different from conformance and more powerful. We pivoted. We went from thin coax to twisted pairs to hubs, and we were championed by startups. So that's how we won. This is a picture of uh, Dave Boggs, who he and I built the first Ethernet card. There is the first Ethernet card right there. And there's the outboard transceiver. And uh, I invited, he did not join 3Com. He stayed in research, but I invited him over for our party to celebrate the 500,000th Ethernet NIC, which had an onboard transceiver. 3Com, very shortly after this, was shipping millions of these cards per month so that we got to put our name on the football stadium in San Francisco, formerly known as Candlestick Park. Uh, and by the way, I can't get you 49ers tickets. Uh, and then we, we proved out this, what I call the Ethernet business model. And this may be what Ethernet is today. It's a business model. Uh, it's native packet mode. It knows where it belongs in the network hierarchy. Uh, we are surfing semiconductors, that is the progress is due entirely to developments on the semiconductor side. We're using IEEE standards. It's not open source, e Ethernet is not open source, its implementations are owned by their designers. Fierce competition, I call it Fokaka. <laughs> this is not Yiddish. <laughs> Freedom of choice among competing alternatives, that's the secret to progress by the way. And it's hilarious to watch Ethernet people at conferences. They're coming up on stage for the panel session and they're fighting on the stairs. It's a very fierce world. And uh, there's rapid evolution and, uh, and this evolution cherishes compatibility with the install base. And this is because once, what I like to call Metcalf's law, which is the bigger your network is, the better. And more importantly, down here, Build it and they will come. Remember I mentioned that the network was 10,000 times, the first Ethernet was 10,000 times faster than its predecessor. 
Did we have a requirements document that said it needed to be 10,000 times? No. We built it as fast as we could, practically, with available semiconductors. And it ended up being 10,000 times faster. And that model has succeeded at the 10, 10 megabit, 100 megabit, gigabit, 10 gigabit. We're now up at 400 gigabit and a terabit soon. So as a result of the growth of the internet, there are many charts like this. I like this one. It starts in 75. So say 73 here is when Ethernet was invented. TCP IP was invented. The cell phone was invented all in 1973. And mostly it was fixed telephone lines for the longest time. And then suddenly, in 1996, wait a minute, Netscape went public with uh, this World Wide Web thingy in 1994. So suddenly, well, the cell phone was growing, but so was the number of Ethernet, uh, internet users. And this chart ends in 2010. Of course, it's not 2010 anymore, isn't it? It's later now. It's 2018. So th this chart, which is all showing up, is a little bit, uh, except for uh, landlines. The only line going down here is uh, telephone landlines. There's a more modern chart. This appears in a superb presentation on the internet, which you should all read if you're interested in the internet. It was done by Mary Meeker, who's a, in, a venture capitalist with Kleiner Perkins, Caulfield and Byers. And she comes out with this every year. Anyway, here's her chart on internet users. So this is 2009 through 17, internet users global. You notice it's going up, but what she notices is the rate of growth is going down. So from 12% to 7% over this period. So, this, so even though we have reason to celebrate, that is we're now reaching, there are 7.6 billion people on Earth we're reaching 2.4 billion of them now on the internet. That's 54.4%. 50 Facebook has over 2 billion friends. That's the good news. The bad news is it appears that the growth rate is slowing down, or so it may seem from this chart. And I've, I'm here to argue against the proposition that it's slowing down. And I begin that argument by noticing that connectivity is not nearly measured, not only measured in the number of users that you reach. There are other dimensions of connectivity. Speed, for example. So even though the number of connectivities is going up, so is the speed is going up from kilobits to megabits to gigabits. And the latencies are going down. And the security is not done yet, but it's going up. And new applications are developing. And that's where I think most of the upward surprise is going to be. So here's Gordon Moore saying, wait a minute, you have a law, don't you? That's what Moore's Law and Metcalf's Law have in common. They both begin with M. There's a network effect now. And so this notion that somehow the connectivity is tapering off now can't be true. And here's some more arguments. Metcalf's Law applied to Facebook did indeed show, uh, this is the 2013 paper, that Facebook is almost halfway there. That is, the install base of Facebook users is almost half of the available internet users. But when it reaches halfway, the model which I use begins to show it growth, growth slowing down at once you get past halfway. But that's assuming that Facebook has no other changes, no speed changes, no security changes, and no advancement of the application. I mean, Facebook is struggling today to have an application that we like, that doesn't steal our data and fill us with hate speech, et cetera. So this chart, which does show the slowdown, assumes that there's no other progress being made in connectivity, which is a foolish assumption. For example, we can be surprised by what killer apps are. The original internet was written so that you could log in from a dumb terminal into somebody's time-sharing system across the country. And that app, for which the internet was built, was called resource sharing, so that you could share that time-sharing system. A year after the internet was built, that was not the killer app. It turned out to be email, which then took over for the next couple of decades. And then we saw the rise of enterprise computing organized around the internet. Microsoft was one of its beneficiaries, web publishing, search, social, 
And each of these was a surprise. Who would have guessed that search would be so important? That Google's now the monster company. And who would have guessed that social would be so important? Not me. And, and on we go. So I'm suggesting that there are many surprises ahead that will all serve to increase the value of this networking. And there have been some surprises. I won't dwell on this, but in 1995, everybody thought that bits would be carried long haul with microwave towers and satellite dishes. And, and short distance, the last mile, would be covered with the wires of the telephone company and the cable company. So wireless long distance, wired short distance. By 2015, the Negropati switch had occurred and it was exactly the opposite. Now we send long distance over optical fibers thanks to dense wave division multiplexing and for the last mile we're using Wi-Fi and LTE. So that there's been this big surprise and there are many, I argue, many surprises ahead. Another surprise, thanks to Marty Cooper, the inventor of the cell phone, he noticed Marconi. Do you remember Marconi? He and I went to school together. He invented the radio. His whole life was about getting the radio to go further and further and further, over the hill at his villa, into town, across the Atlantic. That was how Marconi measured his success. The fact is, according to Cooper, and it's a brilliant insight, the number of conversations you can have by radio in an area has been going up a factor of 2.5 every two years for the last 100 plus years. That is the density of radio communication. And how did that occur? It occurred by having the radio go shorter and shorter distances. So here's Marconi struggling to make radio go further but the answer turned out to be having it go less and less distance. Of course, the reason that works is that by having radio go shorter distances, you can reuse the frequencies in other cells. So here's a surprise. Radios that don't go long distance are better than ones that do. Uh, mind bending to some of us. And then here are some people who really got surprised. Have you heard of voice, video, and data? Seriously. There used to be three industries, voice, which was telephone, video, which was television, and data, which was COBOL. And these fellas, they got surprised. The telephone company looked at the internet and said, oh boy, we do long distance minutes. Can't wait to get all that revenue. Instead, they ended up with short distance hours. With our modems at home, we didn't call around the world. We called a short distance call to a local exchange carrier we didn't use long distance, and we sat on that circuit for hours at a time, not three minutes. So that completely busted their infrastructure and their billing model. And then eventually we threatened, we, the internet, threatened their $200 billion a year in telephone revenue by being able to carry voice almost for free over the internet. So they got surprised. The television industry viewed the internet as a a way of getting interactive TV, but instead they got a million channels, which completely destroyed their advertising model. And then eventually we started carrying video over the internet. Today, I'm a little uncertain about this number, but I've been told that Netflix is 80% of internet traffic today. It's a, if it's not 80, it's a huge number. So the internet basically is now, uh, let's, I don't want to use too strong a language, destroying the television industry. And then there's the COBOL industry, and what we looked for, we computer nerds, is we wanted to share our toy with everybody and get some ubiquity. And instead, we got the World Wide Web, and we got a bunch of newbies who, who liked advertising. And, and so the big surprise over here is advertising became the business model of the internet, the uh, monetization method of the internet. So here comes, oh, I'm almost going to end exactly on time. That's great. Here comes the augmented video mobile gigabit internet. Gigabit, well, it's time. Remember, we went from kilobits in the 60s and 70s to megabits in the 80s and 90s, and now we're going to gigabits. Uh, it's mostly going to be mobile carrying video. It's already mostly video and augmented with all this machine learning and artificial intelligence. And now we're going to add not just people but things to the internet. We call them things because we're not quite sure what they are yet. But as it becomes clear what they are, we stop, like the 
driverless car was a thing, but it's not a thing anymore. Now it's a driverless car. Uh, so the Internet of Things is coming, a whole new kind of traffic. So we're going to revamp healthcare, which is a very big industry, making it network personalized and preventive. We're going to solve energy by making it network cheap, clean, and abundant. We're going to solve education with having brick and mortar education disrupted by Internet learning. We're going, to trans, uh, we're going to substitute transportation of our bits instead of our atoms, and there's going to be surprises here, all of which are driving the continued growth, demand for, and growth of connectivity. So let me end with this formula, which is the short form of Metcalfe's Law, and a reminder that uh, we are suddenly connected and we're not done yet. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to the stage, CEO Arnie Bellini. That was great. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. All right. I forget. Are you sitting there? Or I, I think sitting? you're supposed to be stage right. I was uh, over here. I think I'm stage right or audience. It doesn't right, much I'm matter though. Yes. So um, I just have to say, my I, I'm blown away by that presentation, but mostly by what you've actually accomplished and what you've, what you really have contributed to the ecosystem, to this community, uh, to the history of information technology uh, and technology itself. And, you know, without pioneers like you uh, and very smart people who are clever and innovative and willing to take risks with the $27,000 that they had, the only $27,000 that they had, uh, you've cha you know, changed the world. Uh, and I just think that um, I was very happy to be able to have you come talk to this, this group here because everyone here has made their business. We, this, what you're looking at here is, is a group of people who have laid the, the infrastructure Right? In other words, I, I mean, I remember buying the three pack. I mean, we bought so many three packs from Tech Data. I cannot even begin to tell you how many. Tech Data. Tech Data, yeah. I your remember channel, your channel. My channel, yeah. Exactly. We, uh, Thank you, Tech Data. <laughs> <laughs> and Steve Raymond is uh, uh, on our board of directors. He was the founder of Tech Data. Say hi. I will. Uh, but we would buy all kinds of those uh, three packs, and we got them for less than $1,000 a piece. Uh, we were able to get them a little bit less expensive, but people were willing to pay that price, and we were putting in networks in all throughout the Tampa Bay area as a result of it. And that's really what, you know, ConnectWise started. If, if not for the ability to have success installing networks, ConnectWise doesn't exist because... Well, you all were pioneering the channel of service and support and managed services. And one of the, as I mentioned in my talk, one of the things that went well for us is we decided as a matter of strategy to play ball with the ecosystem instead yep. of the rec recreated ourselves. Yeah, you mentioned uh, you're, you, have a, you had to fricaca. Uh, uh, that's exactly what we're professing to the industry right now. We're saying, you know, to, we've called all of our competitors and said exactly what you did. We said, look, there should be standards, there should be interoperability, there should be choices. Uh, we should all play together. We can still be competitors, but we should offer interoperability, just like you, your concept, to, uh, to our industry, to our ecosystem. So we call that in the Valley, we, you've heard it before probably, co-opetition, where fiercely competitive companies could agree on a standard, and the standard made the pie bigger, and then let the competition begin. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's good for the ecosystem, uh, and it's great for the folks here. So I'm going to open it up to questions because um, I think we just went to school. I mean, I think what's really important here is that the uh, historical perspective, can you bring the lights down? Um, I think the import, can you bring the lights down? Audio visual people? Lights back down? We don't want lights on. No one likes lights. This is a technology group. We don't like the lights on. Turn the lights down. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I think what's important is the historical perspective that you brought today, that you actually lived, and I think it's amazing that you shared that with us personally. Um, we've had some really famous people at our events. We've had Steve Wozniak. Uh, we have had... Um, the other Steve. The other Steve, yeah. We had Steve Wozniak. Uh, we have had uh, Jim Collins, the great business author. 
we have had uh, Simon Sinek. Uh, we have had Michael Gerber uh, of Emith and many others. And they uh, all and turned you down and you're stuck with me. <laughs> <laughs> You're re moving into that stand-up comic uh, phase, I can see. <laughs> so, uh, no, they said yes, and we are very excited to have you added to that group. The historical perspective, I think, is very interesting because what Bob shared is, is really shows you how fast this is moving, shows you how fast it, we got from, a, from a, a very fast start in this industry, and it's just moving along. I agree with the surprises. There's going to be a lot of surprises. So... This is an amazing opportunity for you to ask of Bob Metcalf, the inventor of Ethernet. And, and I want to say this too, you said Tim Berners-Lee is a friend of yours, so actually Tim is our next speaker. Uh, so Tim Berners-Lee will be our keynote speaker at IT Nation uh, later this year uh, here in Orlando in November. And so what's really cool is if you looked at Bob's uh, diagram there, he said, hey, he, got the, he actually got it started here on the bottom with the bottom layer right, with Ethernet, and now we're going to have uh, Tim Berners-Lee who's gone to the very top layer, right, HTTPS, World Wide Web on the top side, so it's going to be really interesting. So Those Tim, are really, I, I look at the two of you and I say, actually I look at the two of you and I'm saying, what I am claiming is that that is, you two are the inventors of the Internet. If you take those two te technologies together, uh, the thing that started it and the thing that finally got it organized, it's like... You could claim that. Well, Tim is the 3Com Founders Professor at MIT. We, we endowed the chair that he occupies. I appreciate your reminding him of that. I will. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll do that. Okay, so let's open it up to questions. Uh, uh, who's got a question for Bob Metcalf? And don't be misled by this shirt. I don't really know anything. <laughs> this, is social, this is social climbing. Yeah. Uh, I guess, I don't know, there's microphones here, yeah? Anyone who wants to ask a question, there's microphones right here in the center. Just run on up, grab them. There's one there, there's one there, there's one there. Hi, Bob. Fire away. Um, just a very, very quick question. First of all, thank you for the presentation. It was highly entertaining, interesting, and so on. But a uh, quick question is, what do you think is the future for Facebook? Based on your surprise theory, I guess. I think what's happening is... The, uh, I've made the general argument that connectivity has come quickly. And I think it's come so quickly, we don't know how to handle it entirely. And Facebook is the leading edge of that. That is, they have this wave of connectivity in the billions, but they're not managing it properly. My, by the way, my daughter worked there for eight years. She just left to move on to something else, but, so I'm a little too close to that. But they, they're just having trouble managing, figuring, you know, when, when they invented the television, the first thing they did was pointed at a theatrical stage and use it as a way for transmitting plays. And it took a while before we invented reality TV much later. So the Facebook, to answer your question, I think Facebook is struggling with how to manage, how to, the right user interface, the right policies for dealing with all this connectivity. And they don't, obviously do not, and uh, Twitter has the same problem. They don't, and Google has the same problem. They don't quite know how to manage it. I think a mistake is being made. We're asking them to become editors. We're asking them to remove the hate speech, which means they need to decide what hate speech is. And I don't, that may not be the, the right solution. The, the, a better solution might be to ask them to produce the tools that other people can use to filter content. Maybe that's a better approach. We'll see. Hi there. Hi. No, over here. Yeah, go ahead. Bald guy. Yeah. Uh, so I've been real lucky. I, uh, I started on uh, BBSs 30 years ago. I, uh, I built a wireless ISP in my 20s and uh, doing 10 gig services uh, nowadays. But we're, a, you know, we're, a, we're, a, we're an independent ISP. And with the increasing commoditization and, and pretty fierce competition from larger organizations, do you see a, a meaningful future where independent ISPs can deliver value? Well, yes and no. If you continue to call yourselves ISPs, you're in trouble. Well, yes. We're, we call ourselves a network service provider, if that's any better. That's better. <laughs> the idea is if you stick to the categories as they now exist, then eventually the consolidation will overtake you. But if you look at diff a different cut, a different categorization, 
so, and be part of the surprise, then there's a rich, full life ahead, if you see what I mean. Yeah, we're, we're pushing the service provider mentality down into like security and the land and that kind of thing. And there seems to be good margins in that. And that's kind of where I see uh, an ability to remain relevant uh, moving forward. Me too. <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for the presentation. Who's next? Thank you very much. Uh -huh. So stepping back to the, your previous life or your, what do you want to say? Um, May 22nd of the year, you said that you invented Ethernet. It was on the, on the slide in the piece of paper. When did it come to you? I mean, it wasn't all on the May 22nd, was it? How long did it take you to get it all put together to, to then put it on a piece of paper to say this is what it's going to be? So one of, my, one of my early experiments in marketing, since an engineer struggling to be a marketing guy, I needed a birthday for Ethernet to hook some promotion on. So I went into a trance and said, what if there were a day, what day would it be? And it turned out to be May 22nd, because that was the day that the Ethernet mem an Ethernet memo got written in which Ethernet was named and some of its principles laid out. But as implied by your question, of course, work had been going on for a long time before that memo and went on for decades after. So that was sort of an arbitrary decision because I needed a hook. I, I needed to name a birthday. So I'm sticking by it, May 22nd. But in fact, it was uh, spread out. For example, I had to spend a month at the University of Hawaii studying randomized retransmission. I recommend, recommend you all do that. Uh, <laughs> so that was a month studying how to share the channel. And we needed a way to share this coax so everyone could take turns. And we found it at the University of Hawaii in the Aloha Network. And that took a month of steady study there uh, at the University of Hawaii where I learned to surf. Uh, uh, and then thereafter, you know, Ethernet was a technology, and then it was a standard, and then it needed to be commercialized. So those are three big projects that took 10 years, too. Am I getting at the, your question? Yeah, I was curious of the, the date, how you came to that. All but, right. So I, I guess the answer is a pretty arbitrary date. But it was a date that Ethernet got named, and it was a date. That, and this memo is available on the internet, you can see. Uh, I suggested calling it Ethernet in this memo. I didn't actually put them together. It was Ethernet. And then later, and that took a year, just moving them together like that. Thank you. <laughs> right here. This is a terrible question, so I apologize in advance. But in uh, starting and, and managing and running such a foundational company like 3Com, what was your greatest regret? If you could go back and do it again, what would you change, and what should we be watching out for? Well, uh, let me flip something over. I didn't learn how to sell soon enough. I did learn how to sell, so that's good, but I didn't learn soon enough. So for example, in 1980, IBM gave me two shots. They paid me 2K each time, once to go to Raleigh and once to go to uh, New Jersey, Franklin Lakes, New Jersey, to convince divisions of IBM to use Ethernet, because that was a big issue in 1980. And both times, I won the argument, but I didn't get the order, because I was years ahead of them in any experience with LANs. We didn't even call them LANs yet. So I could win any argument with those IBM people. What I didn't know is that's not how you get an order. <laughs> you, know, you need to know what the considerations are. You need to know who the decision maker is. You, you need to know a bunch of things. And I had just went Psh! So IBM did not choose, because I failed as a salesperson, did not use Ethernet as its standard. And I, it took us 20 years to kill their alternative, the IBM token ring, are, are which you, I hope you've all forgotten. So you're telling, you're telling me that your poor salesmanship made us suffer with IBM token ring for years? <laughs> Another thing I regret. <laughs> we recruited at some point in the uh, around the time we went, a little after we went public, this uh, young woman to be our marketing lead. And I had been running marketing until her arrival. And uh, have I mentioned that I'm an, engi an engineer? So she and I immediately started arguing as soon as she arrived about what 
we needed, you know, lead generation and sales tools and slides for our sales force and slides for our, for our uh, distributors and value-added resellers and all this. And eventually, she st I drove her out of the company. It took about a year before I finally just drove her out. You remember, I was the founder and major shareholder of the company, and she's every day going like this. So she left, and she became the VP marketing of this startup down the street called Cisco. <laughs> I regret, I regret that. <laughs> I don't even know what to do with that. Uh, <laughs> I think that's Carl over there, yeah? yeah? Hey, hey Ernie. Uh, so given the history that you have and what you've seen in the industry going, I I'm wondering what your take is on net neutrality and some of the legislation going on there. I'm very happy that net neutrality is no more. Uh, you have to be a little bit older than most to remember when the FCC did regulate the internet. So we had to, to build the internet, we had to break the monopoly of IBM, break the monopoly of AT&T and get the, the regulatory bodies, principally the FCC, to stop trying to regulate the internet. So I view net neutrality as part of a recent move under the Obama administration to re-regulate re, re the internet and I'm very happy that it's not there. And, and, and my objections go mostly to the negatives of regulation in general, but also to the specifics of net neutrality. It's absurd to equate the bits in a video with the bits from an IoT with the bits from an email. They're all bits, but they have vastly different values and vastly different provision requirements. So the idea that we're going to treat all bits the same is at the very beginning a bad idea. So anyway, I'm happy the neutrality, so-called neutrality, a good word, by the way, sort of puts me on the defensive. I'm against neutrality. Uh, no, I, I'm against FCC regulation, and the FCC has backed off thanks to the new administration. Yeah. yeah well, I feel the same way about uh, your point about the, uh, you know, what, who defines hate speech, you know? Who do you want in control of that? I think it's the same, same kind of idea. Me. Yeah, I that's right. Me, yeah. myself, and yeah. I. That's right. I don't want to be in charge. All right. Thanks. All right, I think we have time for one more. Yeah? So you spoke a lot about connectivity and how it's increasing, and a big word used now is hyperconnected. As our society becomes more hyperconnected, what do you think is the biggest human challenge in adjusting to that new reality? Well, there's a little, uh, it's a hard question. Uh, you know, there's freedom of speech, and there's also freedom to not listen. So when you turn the internet on, suddenly, and I'm uh, addicted to uh, Facebook and especially to, what's the other one called? MySpace? I'm, <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> anyway, I'm addicted to social media and I tweet, oop, I tweet um, 15 times a day. I get consistent advice from my wife and children and colleagues at the university that I should stop, but I can't. <laughs> and uh, I'm an addictive personality. So I think the addiction of online social and the, the notion that because we have freedom of speech that you should tweet a lot, that's a bad notion right there. In fact, I frequently remind students who I get a chance to uh, intervene with, I, I tell them, you are not obligated to express your opinion on all topics at all times. Uh, but I can't even live by that rule myself. Whenever I see something go by on Twitter, I just have to add my own two cents. So I think that's probably the first um, difficulty of having this hyper-connected social world is we don't know what to do with all that connectivity. We're still learning, we're still developing the tools. So there's an opportunity out there for innovation is figuring out how to properly organize all this opinionation and reporting and so on that's going on on social media. We don't quite have it yet. We're not, we're not close. Thank you. All right, so I have one last question and that is knowing what this group does, um, the IT nation, if you will, um, largely managed service providers, you mentioned that hey, look, you know, we've laid the infrastructure, local area networks are everywhere, internet is everywhere, 
the use of all of this is amazing and the information revolution is in full swing and it's going to have a lot of surprises. Um, this is really the group that actually is bringing forth a lot of companies and spe specifically small, primarily small to mid-sized business and mid-enterprise companies that they outsource to these folks right here, right? They are outsourcing to these folks and we know security is going to be a big issue, right? Got to make the data secure. Good news. Thank you, 3Com. Thank you, Bob Metcalf. We've digitized everything in the world. Everything in the world is now online and now, oh wow, it's worth a lot of money and data is now the new gold and lots of cyber attacks, lots of, you know, if I can push in and get through a hole, I can get to that data. And so, you know, cyber attacks are on the rise like crazy. And the value of the data is just going up, up, up. So security is going to be kind of the big issue that we see going into the future and how we're going to work to secure the data. Give us kind of your thoughts of knowing where everything has gone and where it's likely to go from your perspective. Uh, what advice would you give to this, this group here who has to take care of small to mid-sized business and mid-enterprise technology needs? What do, what do we I feel a little unqualified to answer that question because when I was benefiting from the existence of y'all, uh, the market wasn't very big. It was nerds selling to, uh, I'm sorry, geeks selling to geeks. That's changed now. So now, as you just said, the markets are huge and the kinds we of people... We can be pretty geeky still. Well, I'm, I tend toward a geekier than thou attitude now and then. <laughs> So security, you remember I bragged that Ethernet knew where it fit in the hierarchy, the layers of the internet? Well, what, I, what I used to say was security wasn't my job. Security was something that people above, you know, higher, the one, nearer the ones having all the fun, it was their job. That is, we weren't gonna solve security by putting secret voltages on the Ethernet cable. It was gonna be done in software up there. And I've had occasion to reconsider that from time to time. You can, put, you can put encryption and other crypto things at all layers of the internet. Uh, so as far as I know, ethernet is not secretly cryptoed yet. Uh, I'm also, uh, so I that's another thing to regret. Maybe we should have looked more carefully at security. I wrote the first, you know what RFPs are? Those are the internet documents. I wrote the first one announcing a security breach of the internet in 1973. Oh, wow. Uh, two high school students broke into the internet out of Los Angeles in 1973. My, my, uh, in December, so my headline, the headline of my RFP was, the stockings were hung by the chimney with care. <laughs> and of course, Santa Claus didn't show up. These two brats from a high school in Los Angeles showed up. <laughs> So the network's been insecure for a very long time, and it, right. I guess it's a constant battle. So going back to the role, the, going back to the very difficult question of the ongoing role, uh, one needs to reconsider the parameters of connectivity and the applications of connectivity, and security is one of them. It's not a solved problem. So there's an opportunity for all of us to somehow work on that problem in a differentiated way. That's just one example of something that we might do, security. I'm not, um, of course, now we have quantum, it's alleged that we have quantum computing coming and that's gonna, I don't know if it's coming. Well, no, I both think it's coming and I don't think it's coming at the same time. <laughs> There's a few geeks out there. <laughs> anyway, could you ask me a simpler question? I hate to close on such a whiny answer. <laughs> well, then let's see if I can come up with an even better one then. Well, let me just, while you're thinking of that, I'm here to say thanks. My company, when it was struggling with 25, 30 people in the early 80s, we saw that the channel, the, what we called the channel, and eventually we were two-step channel, was the way to go, and we were right. You all, or your predecessors, uh, made all the difference in the world and helped accelerate the proliferation of connectivity. And I'm just here not only to thank you, but to say your job is not done. Your job is not done. I mean, it's not the, remember in 1900s, the guy heading the patent office said, everything has been invented already. We might as well shut down the patent office. 
Did you notice that this week the 10 millionth patent was, Ethernet's only a f around the 4 millionth patent. This week, the 10 millionth patent got filed. Wow. So innovation is not over. That guy in 1900 was wrong, and to think that what we're doing is over is wrong. There's lots of opportunity for it. Anyway, thank you, and let me encourage you to continue uh, spreading connectivity. Robert Metcalf, the inventor of Ethernet. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.